Well, good morning to you all. I'd like you to turn, please, if you would, to the book of Ezekiel once more. And we're going to read from chapter 5. I'm going to read the first nine verses. And we're going to be considering a very strange haircut. <laughs> That's going to be the theme of our chapter, a very strange haircut. So uh, looking in verse 1, it says, And thou, son of man, take thee a sharp knife, take thee a barber's razor, and cause it to pass upon thine head, and upon thy beard, then take the balances to weigh and divide the hair. Thou shalt burn with fire a third part in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are fulfilled, and thou shalt take a third part and smite about it with a knife, and a third part thou shalt scatter in the wind, and I will draw out a sword after them. Thou shalt also take thereof a few in number and bind them in thy skirts. Then take of them again and cast them into the midst of the fire and burn them in the fire, for thereof shall a fire come forth unto all the house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. And she hath changed my judgments into wickedness more than the nations and my statutes more than the countries that are round about her for they have refused my judgments and my statutes they have not walked in them therefore thus saith the lord god because ye multiplied more than the nations that are round about you and have not walked in my statutes neither have you kept my judgments neither have done according to the judgments of the nations that are round about you. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I, even I, am against thee and will execute judgments in the midst of thee in the sight of the nations. And I will do in thee that which I have not done and whereunto I will not do any more the like because of all thine abominations." And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us this morning. It's good just to kind of a little bit of a review of where we're at. We're kind of in this section in the book of Ezekiel where there are a lot of um, signs that are taking place, these kind of acted out kind of uh, messages. And of course, the first one that we saw in chapter three is the fact that he is made dumb. Uh, he's bound and he's, he's basically a housebound prophet. And so that was the first kind of setting the stage. But after that, uh, it introduces four subsequent visions. And uh, the first one, or, or kind of uh, illustrations or signs, the first one was the the war games one, the inscribed tile, uh, the, the the pan. Uh, so and that predicted the coming of the siege. Okay, so the first of the pictures showed the coming of the siege of Jerusalem. And then the next one was the, the prophet laying on his side, on his right side, and then on his left side. And of course, that laid out for us, not so much the coming of the siege, but the cause of the siege. It was the iniquity of Israel and Judah. And God was basically uh, executing judgment upon them because of their iniquities so we had the coming of the siege the cause of the siege and then the defiled bread uh picture that we saw was basically the conditions during the siege so there'll be there'll be famine there'll be scarcity of bread there'll be scarcity of fuel there'll be scarcity of water so it's talking about the conditions during the siege and now we're on the fourth sign consecutively in chapter 5, the shaven head, and we're going to think about the conclusion of the siege. How's it all going to end? Okay, so really this is all about the siege. Coming of the siege, cause of the siege, conditions during the siege, and finally the conclusion of the siege. And so it's this chapter about the strange haircut. Now, I'd like us to uh, go back to the book of Isaiah chapter 7, and I think we're going to get some real help from Isaiah 7 in understanding what the significance and the meaning of this haircut is. And in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 20, 
we read this, in the same day shall the Lord shave with a razor that is hired, namely by them beyond the river, by the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it shall also consume the beard. So God has used this picture before in Isaiah's prophecy, and of course it was of the Assyrian invasion of the northern kingdom or the ten tribes and basically god used them as his instrument to basically uh, just like shaving the the hair removes unwanted hair well it's removing people that are no longer wanted they're they're cast off and they're basically they're going to be uh, swept from the land so the prophet isaiah compares the shaving of a man's head and a beard to the invasion of an enemy in Isaiah, the king of Assyria is the one wielding the razor, whereas here in Ezekiel, God's instrument is not the king of Assyria, but it's Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. So like a shaver removed unwanted hair, he would remove them from the land. Now, as we think about this uh, picture of shaving the head in scripture, I want to just bring a couple of uh, kind of thoughts from other scriptures about it first of all it's usually connected with disgrace and humiliation it's a sign of disgrace and humiliation so if we look back to second samuel uh, kind of a familiar story to many of us second uh, samuel chapter 10 and verse 4 and uh, we read uh, these uh, ambassadors that david had sent uh, to uh, the children of Ammon. And it says in verse four, wherefore Hanun took David's servants, shaved off the one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks and sent them away. And of course, uh, David tells them, stay until that your beard grows again, because there was a shame connected with that. Uh, even again in Ezekiel chapter seven and verse 18. We read, they also they shall also gird themselves with sackcloth, and horror shall cover them, and shame shall be upon all faces, and baldness upon all their heads. So again, it's usually connected with disgrace, humiliation, and shame. And priests particularly had to take particular care of their beards. Uh, so if we look at the book of Leviticus, and uh, we'll see uh, that they had to be very careful about their appearance as they represented God uh, in their activities. Uh, but in Leviticus 21, verse 5 and 6, it says, uh, they shall, speaking of the priests, they shall not make baldness upon their head, neither shall they shave off the corner of their beard, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. They shall be holy unto their God and not profane the name of their God, the offerings of the Lord made by fire and the bread of their God they, they do offer. Therefore, they shall be holy. So again, even the priests. And so this is, this is why this particular vision would have really grabbed their attention. Because remember, Ezekiel is a priest. He's not supposed to shave his head. He's not just supposed to trim his beard. And so it, here he is before them. <laughs> publicly shaving his head and his beard. And the people must have been stunned. Uh, and again, we would say this, that it's taking extreme measures to get their attention. They've not been listening to the word of God. They just haven't been paying attention. And so it's taking extreme measures uh, to really get their attention. Uh, one final thing about the uh, shaving of a head as well. Not only was it a sign of disgrace and shame, it was also a sign of mourning. And so just a couple of scriptures as we uh, compare scripture with scripture, try and get some understanding of the significance of the shaving of the head. Isaiah's prophecy, chapter 22 and verse 12, we read this. It says, and in that day, uh, the Lord God of hosts called to weeping and to mourning and to baldness and to girding with sackcloth. And so as a sign of mourning, uh, often people would shave their head. And if you look at Jeremiah chapter 7, again, we get this concept of mourning associated with the shaving of the head. Uh, chapter 7, verse 29, 
It says, cut off thine hair, O Jerusalem, and cast it away, and take up a lamentation on high places, for the Lord hath rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. Cut off thine hair, O Jerusalem, and cast it away. So, shaving the head, a sign of shame, disgrace, and mourning. So, as we look at the text, we'll notice in verse 1, it says, And thou, son of man, take thee a sharp knife, uh, take the uh, barber's razor, cause it to pass upon thine head and upon thy beard, then take the balances to weigh and divide the hair. Because the word that's used here for knife is a word that is the word kereb, which is normally the word for sword. And so the, the idea is that he takes a sword and he uses it as a razor, just as God is going to use, as it were, the sword of Nebuchadnezzar and his army to shave the land of its inhabitants. This sword is used as a razor. And so Ezekiel is to, uh, to take it, to shave his head and his beard. And once he has done it, he then has to weigh it on balances. And so it says, it calls it to uh, pass upon thine head and upon thy beard and then take the balances to weigh it and divide the hair. I can't help but think of the Holocaust when the um, the Jews were taken into the concentration camps. And one of the first things they did was shave off their hair and their beards. And again, how humiliating it must have been for these Jews. And of course, they took their hair and they used it for all kinds of purposes. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, again, just with that picture. And so here's this prophet, but he's also a priest and he is doing this. And then he has to weigh it on scales with great care and dividing it by weight into three parts. And so he says, then take the balances to weigh and divide the hair. Thou shalt burn with fire a third part. So it, again, it, three parts of the third. And so again, it takes a um, little imagination to see Ezekiel in action. First, wetting the sword blade uh, to a sharp cutting edge while the crowd gathered to see what new act he was going to be performing. Uh, they've w witnessed his war games. They've witnessed the, the baking, the bread, the lying on his side, all these things. And now he's doing this and they're watching. And the horrified gasp of the bystanders as he went to work with his crude razor, followed by the meticulous weighing of the hair in the balances. And you can see how it would really, you know, this is the day before TikTok and internet and all that kind of distraction. Uh, and so it would have been quite the scenario for them to watch this. And um, again, we're, we're suggesting to you <clears throat> that this removal of the hair from the head and face symbolized the removal of the population from Judah and Jerusalem in particular. Notice again, verse 2, he says, Thou shalt burn with fire a third part of it in the midst of the city when the days of the siege are, are fulfilled, and thus shalt take a third part. And so the idea of in the midst of the city. And again, most likely, and again, we can't be dogmatic about this, but the, the idea was this. He's, he's playing these war games, and presumably when the siege is over in the war game, then he cuts the hair puts a third part of it in the city because he's not taken to Jerusalem or anything like that. Remember, he's he's uh, by the uh, the banks uh, of the, the river, uh, uh, Tel Aviv or the, the, the Grand Canal. And so no doubt acting this out. And um, so as he does it, um, it, it tells us this, that uh, uh, just one more thing about the weighing, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> we, we said that the sword... Uh, stands for the Babylonians just as the same way as the razor symbolized the Assyrian in Isaiah 7 verse 20. But the hair being weighed prior to being divided also is a picture that's been conveying a message. Weighing in scripture is a symbol of evaluation. Uh, how many of us have not heard in the gospel, uh, the book of Daniel in chapter 5 uh, being used in very effective gospel preaching in verse 26 and 27. Uh, of course, this is uh, <clears throat> the judgment on Belshazzar. And it says in verse 26, this is the interpretation of the thing. Many God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances 
and art found wanting. And what a picture. If this hair symbolizes the population of Judah and Jerusalem, God is weighing them in the balances and he's finding them wanting. And so it speaks of evaluation. Uh, another example would be uh, 1 Samuel. <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter 2, and I could cite other examples. I noticed some more this week just in my regular readings, but uh, for the sake of time, we'll just mention these two very obvious ones. Uh, this is Hannah praying, and she says in verse 3, Talk no more so exceedingly proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. <clears throat> actions are weighed. So, <clears throat> it's evaluation. And what he's saying is he has evaluated very carefully the actions of the people of Judah and Jerusalem. He's found them wanting. And as a result of that, judgment must fall upon them. <clears throat> and so they divided his hair into three parts. One part is burned with fire on the siege brick that's my suggestion to you that that's it's burned on fire in the city uh, we get that from verse two burn with fire third part in the midst of the city so he's using the siege brick to do it to symbolize those who would die in the famine pestilence of jerusalem during the siege a third of them would die during that time frame how do we know that well if you look down to verse 12 the the best commentary on scripture is scripture and so you'll notice in verse 12 a third part of thee shall die with the pestilence and with famine shall they be consumed in the midst of thee so that clearly relates to this third part that's of the hair that's burned in the city uh, that is the third, those that died during the siege through the famine and pestilence of course burning with fire uh, it always symbolizes in scripture judgment so the famine that came upon them was a judicial act of God, and a third of them perished in the famine. Another part uh, was to be hacked to pieces. And so it says, uh, again, let's go back to verse 2, Thou shalt burn with fire a third part in the midst of the city. When the days of the siege are fulfilled, thou shalt take a third part and smite about it with a knife, and a third part thou shalt scatter in the wind, and I will draw out a sword after them. So this the second part now, hacked to bits. Uh, so he just throws his hair up and then he's with a sword. You can just imagine how graphic it must have been as they watch this. And again, the language is this, symbolizing those who are going to be killed by the Babylonian soldiers. And again, notice verse 12 for a commentary on that. And so uh, again, he says, a third part shall die with the pestilence, with famine, Shall they be consumed in the midst of thee? A third part shall fall by the sword round about thee. And so, so in the, you know, maybe trying to escape after the siege is broken around the city, a third part of them would be slaughtered. And then the final third part, scattered to the winds, pictured the Jews scattered amongst the Gentiles and the exiles taken to Babylon. So that's three thirds. That's 99%. But there's still some left. And so he says in verse 3, Thou shalt also take thereof a few in number and bind them in thy skirts. And so uh, we'll think about this tiny remnant. But I just want to go back again just to that group that are, you know, where he throws the hair up and, and starts hacking it to pieces. And uh, it would speak those that, that are scattered. Um, and uh, back in Leviticus 26, the Lord predicted all of these things would happen to them if they broke his covenant. And so just a verse, Leviticus 26, verse 33, it says, I will scatter you among the heathen and will draw out a sword after you and your land shall be desolate and your cities waste so so what god was doing was keeping his word he had told them look if you despise my covenant if you break my covenant there will be consequences and and he spelled out the consequences so very clearly and now all god is doing is clearly fulfilling his 
word. Keep your finger in Leviticus 26. We're going to come back there in a moment. But we're, we're now talking about this small portion. The remaining 1% is hid in the hem of his garment. Again, perhaps a picture of God's special care for a remnant of his people who would be spared to return to the land. The Lord also promised back in Leviticus 26, not only would he scatter them and do all these things, but he would also spare a remnant. So if you look at verse 36 of Leviticus 26, and upon them that are left alive of you, I will send a faintness into their hearts in the lands of their enemies, and the sound of a shaken leaf shall chase them, and they shall flee as fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when none pursueth. And they shall fall one upon another, as it were, before a sword, when none pursueth, and you shall have no power to stand before your enemies, and you shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And they that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands, and also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. So even those that are left, it's not a, it's not a happy life for them. And again, as we look at the history of Israel, and you think of all the sadness, you know, the, the, the Holocaust, the pogroms of Russia, that even those that survived have suffered tremendously down through the years. And even to this very hour, uh, I, I just saw a headline yesterday. Um, actually, it's interesting that there's a group going directly from here, from the conference. They're flying to Israel on a tour of Israel, uh, quite a number of them. Uh, are going and they're flying out on, on Saturday. But yesterday, over 200 rockets were fired into Israel from Hezbollah in Lebanon. So even now, <laughs> it's they're, they're suffering as a people. And so, but yet there is a remnant and God always does have a remnant. But even for that remnant, it says in verse four, back in Leviticus chapter five, it says, then take of them again, and cast them into the midst of the fire, and burn them in the fire, for thereof shall a fire come forth unto all the house of Israel. So again, he's saying that even the remnant, um, anyone who spared, should not take their safety for granted, for more fire could come out from God's judgment in, on, on Jerusalem. And, and we know that as a general principle, God never leaves himself without a witness and the doctrine of the remnant is an important teaching in Scripture. Uh, we know that from the, the terrible apostate days of Ahab and Jezebel, that when Elijah thought that he was the only one, the Lord reminded him there were 7,000 that had not bowed the knee to Baal. However, the, the remnant still would be a suffering remnant, and many of them still, even the numbers are going to be reduced even further. So you got 1% left, and even them there's going to be a, a suffering and a perishing of, of some of those. But God still has to keep a remnant. Why does he have to keep a remnant? Why is it so critical? I want to just read a couple of scriptures again from Isaiah chapter 10. See, I, I, without the remnant, how can God fulfill his promises? Um, where's the Messiah going to come from? <laughs> if they're, all of the Jews are destroyed. Uh, how is he going to fulfill his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? So if you look at Isaiah 10 and verse 21 and verse 22, it says, The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. So God still is saying, yeah, despite all of the suffering, despite the re reducing the nation, right, 99% are going to suffer tremendously. Uh, even the 1% are going to be affected. But nevertheless, there is going to be a remnant. And so if you look again in Jeremiah chapter, chapter 23, another one of these promises, he says, and I will gather the remnant, this is Jeremiah 23 verse 3, I will gather the remnant remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. So we, we do know that a remnant is going to survive. It's critical 
that there's a remnant because without a remnant, we would have no savior. Without a remnant, God's promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob could never be fulfilled. However, the lesson here is that even that remnant would suffer, uh, even if they survived the siege, uh, they'd be reduced even further. That further reducing the actual number means that just a small number would be preserved and those that that did survive would suffer and so when you read the book of jeremiah and we won't take time to go there right now but jeremiah chapters 40 through 44 details the trials of those that were left in the land after the destruction of the city and the sanctuary in Jerusalem. It includes the assassination of Gedaliah, uh, the descent into Egypt under Johanan. I mean, just a lot of, uh, it was, it wasn't plain sailing for those that actually even managed to survive uh, those events. Uh, they suffered tremendously. And so that's what he is predicting here. So from verses five down through 11, God now is giving the, his justification of the coming judgment. And the four um, sermons that were kind of acted out are now going to be explained directly and forcibly. In other words, God has given these pictures, and now he's going to open the mouth of the prophet. Remember, who is up to this point has been dumb, and now God is going to speak and give a message through his servant. And, of course, you would you would think that the people that he is speaking to, he has their undivided attention as a result of these action sermons that have been given. And so it says in verse 5, Thus saith the Lord God, This is Jerusalem. I have set it in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. This is Jerusalem. So he he tells us, all of this, these pictures, it's really the siege is Jerusalem. Uh, the, the suffering is concerning Jerusalem. Now, to these exiles, it would have, they would have felt that the city of Babylon was a more appropriate target for God's judgment. Nevertheless, God states, no, this is not Babylon I'm talking about. This is Jerusalem. I want you to notice that this is Jerusalem. And so he tells us why. Why was Jerusalem going to be judged so severely? And I want to suggest to you that the first reason is because of abused privilege. Of all cities, this was a city where the glory of God dwelt, right? It, I mean, to whom much is given, much will be required. The very glory of God was in that temple, uh, in the midst of them. And so it really comes down to this, that uh, they they were given so many privileges and they had abused those privileges. And that's why the severity of the judgment. And so he says, therefore, thus saith the Lord, this is Jerusalem. I have, he says, I have set thee in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. So th this is really interesting. The word that's used here in the midst of the nations is literally the navel like the belly button of the nations, if you want to put it that way. And so the thought is, and many of, of the rabbis refer to Israel as geographically the navel of the world. And so as far as God's eternal purposes were, um, this city was to be the center of the nations. And it is kind of interesting where it's located. You know, you've got uh, Europe, you've got Asia. I mean, everything surrounds that. It really is a very central uh, location uh, in the, the then known world. Remember, the US wasn't even thought about until 200 and what something years ago. So, and then, and so this continent's not part of the picture, but the world as it was then, the very geographic center of the world as far as God was concerned and his purposes was Israel because all the continents that kind of came into it, Europe and Asia. And so he talks about it as the center of the nations. Now, let me give you a few. And by the way, I really believe it is the center of the nations in terms of God's purposes for the world. Um, that This is the epicenter of where God is going to work 
in the end times and bring about his ultimate purposes. But if you look to Ezekiel 38, for instance, you see this idea again of them being the center of the nations. 38 uh, to verse 12, uh, it says, uh, this is the armies of Gog and Magog, it says, to take a spoil, to take a prey, uh, to turn thine hand upon the desolate places that are now inhabited and upon the people that are gathered out of the nations which have gotten cattle and goods that dwell in the midst of the land. Again, that's the idea of the navel of the land. They're, they're, they're in the center. Uh, God has put them in that center place. And, of course, the reason that God did that was they were meant to be a light to the surrounding nations. Let me go back to the book of Isaiah and chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 2. And we'll look at verses 1 through 4. It says, The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, and he shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nations neither shall they learn war anymore. So in a coming day, clearly, what should have been re real for Israel throughout their history, it was meant to be this light to the Gentiles, where the Gentiles came to them, said to them, tell us about your God. We want to learn about him. Just like uh, the example of, uh, of Solomon, the Queen of Sheba, uh, coming, uh, right? Because uh, the, if they were walking with God, he would bless them, and they would be, as it were, this light set on a hill, this city that could not be hid. And so that's the, the picture here. That's what they should have been. But we're going to say, tragically, God has to judge them, because instead of giving a good picture of what God was like, they had rejected his glory, and they had embraced paganism beyond even the gentiles and so that's why this judgment was so necessary again just a couple of other references in isaiah of course speaking of what israel ought to be and what the true israelite the lord jesus would prove to succeed where they fell uh, failed and so isaiah 42 is one of those servant songs but it says i the lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people and for a light to the gentiles chapter 49 verse 6 of isaiah same idea that the lord jesus the true israelite is doing that which the nation should have done. He said, Is it a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to restore the preserved of Israel? I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation to the end of the earth. So that was that always God's purpose. Uh, they were meant to be a light to the nations. Even the Lord Jesus said, salvation is of the Jews. Uh, they, they were the ones that had the word of God. Uh, they were the ones who through the Messiah would come. So Jerusalem, the chosen city, was the spiritual center of the earth. And of course, in a coming day, when the Lord Jesus will reign from Jerusalem, it will finally fulfill its divine purpose of being, as we saw in Isaiah chapter 2, that place that would be the the, as it were, the light, the instructor, the teacher of the nations, where people would come and say, teach us about your God. And so this is the picture. Now, one thing I want you to notice from verse 5 uh, down to verse 7, we have a phrase, round about thee, that is mentioned. And so at the end of verse 5, this is Jerusalem, I've set in the midst of the nations and countries that are round about her. In verse 6, again he says, She hath changed my judgments to wickedness more than the nations, and my statutes more than the countries that are round about her. Verse 7, twice we see it. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have multiplied more than the nations that are round about you and have not walked in my statutes, neither have kept my judgments, neither have 
done according to the judgments of the nations that are round about you. And so great emphasis here on the idea of where they're placed and their influence on those that are round about them. Of course, we need to ask ourselves, what kind of an influence do we have on those that are round about us? What about our local assembly? Does it have a good testimony about those that are round about? And so that that's the picture here. They, they were meant to be a light to those round about them. But instead, not only did they abuse privileges in chapter 5, God has set them there. God had given them this purpose, and they abused their privileges, and they they they, they were a terrible testimony. In verse 6, they abandoned principles. The very principles that would make them stand out, they abandoned them. And so it says, verse 6, she hath changed my judgments into wickedness more than the nations, and my statutes more than the countries that are round about her. For they have refused my judgments and my statutes, they have not walked in them. So instead of being this witness to the heathen nations, Israel had rejected God's statutes. No other nation had been and given a justice system, a, a legal system like this nation, and they completely rejected it, and they enacted laws and, and brought in uh, statutes and things like that, which were worse than the nations round about them. They, uh, the, these people who were witness to the nations, Israel out them and excelled them in idolatrous practices. And so the thought is this, light brings responsibility. Rejection of light leads to darkness. And how great is that darkness? And there is accountability. God is going to judge them for this. And so she, she had thoroughly had been thoroughly aware of God's statutes and judgments, unlike the surrounding nations, but had really basically rejected them and had turned her back on them and out the nations. And again, we've already quoted it, but Luke 12, 48 says, to whom much is given, much shall be required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. And so this is where we find Israel, that we find the, this nation as basically um, uh, not only abused privileges, but abandoned principles, rejected them wholesale. And so as a result of, of this abused privilege and abandoned principles, I want you to notice from verse 7 through 11, uh, we have the word therefore four times. Verse 7, therefore, thus saith the Lord God. As a result of this, there are going to be consequences. Verse 8, therefore, thus saith the Lord God. Verse 10, therefore, the fathers shall eat the sons. Verse 11, wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely. And so basically... What we're looking at now is the appropriate punishment for abused privilege and abandoned principles. What is the appropriate punishment? The Lord says, therefore. So notice verse 7. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you multiplied more than the nations that are round about you and have not walked in my statutes, neither have kept my judgments, neither have done according to the judgments of the nations that are round about you. So, so not only did they not do what God had given them, they didn't even live up to the standards of the nations round about them. They actually were worse in their conduct than the surrounding nations. I mean, what an indictment. Neither have done according to the judgments of the nations that are round about them. And so uh, Judah not only broke God's covenant, but they even failed to keep the code of ethics of the surrounding nations. The word multiplied here is an unusual word. It's only found here uh, in the the entire Old Testament, uh, this particular Hebrew word. And uh, it, it, um, it is associated with a verb to make a noise or to rage. And so the thought is that Israel, with so much pri privilege, became turbulent and raged against God and his ways. Uh, that's the idea. They raged against God and his ways. Again, I'd like us to go back to Jeremiah in chapter 2. In verse 11, Jeremiah 2, verse 11, lots of parallelism with this uh, book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. 2, verse 11, he says this. 
he says, hath a nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods, but my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. So again, they have just kind of completely abandoned God, abandoned his glory, and adopted new gods, which gave no profit whatsoever. So since the, the people of God refuse to be an example of righteousness and godliness, God was going to use them anyway as an example of chastening. He promised the severest form of judgment, um, admonitions that are unprecedented, oh, sorry, abominations that are unprecedented call for extraordinary judgment. So when we get to verse 9, he says, I will do in thee that which I have not done, and whereunto I will not do any more the like because of all thine abominations. So the things that he's going to do to them in a sense, the the crime, the punishment is going to fit the crime. They have done abominably. God is going to deal with them in a very severe way. And so, what is He going to do? Verse eight. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God: Behold, I even I am against thee, and will execute judgments in the midst of thee, in the sight of the nations. They had done all their sinning in the sight of the nations. God was going to do His judging in the sight of the nations. They could witness it. They would see it themselves. And what frightful words to hear from God's prophet to the nation. I am against thee. Isn't it wonderful that in contrast, we can go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 31 and say, if God before us, who can be against us? Oh, what a contrast to have a God who is for us that and a God who is against us. But what horror must have come into their hearts to hear God say, I am against you. And so he's against them. And we saw already in verse 9, his judgment is going to be very severe upon them. It will be a warning to the surrounding nations that the God of Israel was a God of justice. Never before had God brought such severe judgment upon his people as he did in the fall and conquest of Jerusalem under the Babylonians. One may say that since then, such judgments maybe have equaled or surpassed them as in the fall of Jerusalem under the Romans, uh, but not before. This was unique. And so as we think of it, say, though the old world perished by water and the judgment was greater in its extent, and Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by fire, Yet neither one or the other was a lingering a death like this. You see, these poor Jews, it wasn't, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, when the fire and brimstone fell, you were dead. I mean, it was like instantaneous. When the flood came, you didn't have a lot of time. It was pretty instantaneous, the judgment. But the, the, the siege of Jerusalem and then the subsequent chasing the, the Jews that were scattered with the sword, all of these things. It was a slow and lingering a death. These poor Jews were long dying and felt themselves to be dying. And so that's the severity connected with this judgment. Now notice verse 10, Therefore the fathers shall eat the sons in the midst of thee, and the sons shall eat their fathers, and I will execute judgments in thee and the whole remnant of thee will I scatter into all the winds. So we find a description of some of the suffering that will take place during the siege. And one of the aspects of this suffering during the siege of Jerusalem would be cannibalism. Now we know that this actually did happen. And again, imagine for Jews who have been so adamant about being kosher and and uh, uh, all of these things, and like Ezekiel, you know, I've never, he, he, human dung was, you know, something he felt he couldn't, he couldn't tolerate. Well, how about eating your own offspring? And so Levitic, uh, Jeremiah chapter, oh, sorry, Lamentations chapter four, just before Ezekiel, Lamentations four and verse 10, you get, Again, some of the descriptions of the sufferings that occurred during this time. It says, verse 10, The hands of the pitiful women have sodden their own children. They were their meat in the destruction of the daughter of 
my people. And so can you imagine the, the ultimate horror of having to cook and eat your own children in the siege? That It shows the measure of desperation that they had reached. And of course, this was all predicted. Leviticus 26, verse 29, it says, you shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters shall you eat. Again, God telling them, this is the these are the consequences that will come upon you if you reject my covenant. Human plight can know no, no greater depths than this. God had warned them many, many times in the word of God about the consequences of their persistent sin and rebellion against God's covenant. But they didn't pay attention. They didn't listen. And now they're literally going to be involved in cannibalism. You say, well, yeah, this is all terrible, but how does it relate to us? Well, we just finished before we did Ezekiel, the book of Galatians. And then in Galatians, he says, there's such a thing as spiritual cannibalism. And he talks in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 15. And you probably know the scripture that I'm thinking of. But there's a danger that amongst the people of God, we bite and devour one another. Galatians 5, 15. But if you bite and devour one another, take heed that you be not consumed one of another. And what a tragedy it is, isn't it, when God's people literally uh, eat each other up, as it were, as they practice spiritual cannibalism and and uh, you know, treat each other so despicably. So not only uh, back in uh, our passage in Ezekiel chapter 5 is there going to be this shocking uh, eating of their offspring, but also he says, uh, verse at the end of verse 10, it says, And the whole remnant of thee will I scatter unto all the winds. And so again, this, this dispersion of the Jewish people at that time throughout the, the Babylonian Empire. But, and of course, there'll be subsequent dispersions. We know that uh, in uh, in the uh, uh, siege of Jerusalem in AD 70, the Jews were scattered then again over the world. But I just want us to know, folks, that there's a coming day where instead of dispersion, there will be an ultimate regathering and the nation will be brought back together. And some of the events we've seen have brought many of them back together, but there's still many that are in exile in various countries. But in the end times, it says this in Matthew 24, 31, he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet and they shall gather together his elect, speaking of the elect nation, from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And so the Jewish uh, dispersion will ultimately give place in the last days to a, a Jewish regathering. Verse 11, wherefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, surely because thou hast defiled my sanctuary with all thy detestable things and with all thine abominations, therefore will I also diminish thee, neither shall mine eye spare, neither will I have any pity. Again, as a, a, a tremendously solemn, solemn statement of God here. This phrase, as I live, it, it's a pledging on, on the basis of the very existence of God. Uh, as I live, as, as I, I am this self-existent one, um, and so uh, I'm going to carry out this judgment. I'm actually swearing on the very basis of my existence, as I live, saith the Lord. It's kind of interesting that it's repeated frequently through the book of Ezekiel, at least 14 times, maybe more, it says, as I live, saith the Lord. He says it more than any other prophet of God. And so the idea is this, they could expect no pity. They had gone beyond the point of no return and judgment had to fall. Now, I'm not going to look up every reference to as I live, but I just want to give you a few just to see what I mean by this, that it's used frequently in Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 16. He says, though these three men were in it, because that's Noah, Daniel, and Job, he says, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither their sons nor daughters. The owner shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Uh, 
14, verse 20. Uh, Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God. And, and it just goes on and on all the way through the book, right up to chapter 35 uh, and verse 11. Between 511 and 35, verse 11, at least 14 times, he says, as I live, saith the Lord. And so why is his there no turning back? Why is there no pity? Why is he going to carry this out? He says, as I live, saith the Lord, God, surely because they have defiled my sanctuary. And I want to just think about this. They had defiled the sanctuary of God. Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 8 just for a minute, because Ezekiel is taken in spirit into Jerusalem, and he's actually allowed to go in to the very temple of God. And from chapter 8 and verse 5, all the way down to verse 18, he's He's given a look into the sanctuary to see what was going on there. And we won't read it all, but I'm just going to read a bit of it. It says, Then said he unto me, Ezekiel 8, 5, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now the way toward the north. So I lifted up mine eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, the image of jealousy in the entry. He said, Furthermore, unto to me, son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. But turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court. And so he's kind of working his way in, uh, into the inner sanctuary. And, and he's been shown what's going on there. Uh, and... Um, just terrible things. He says, verse uh, verse 15, Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, thou shalt see greater abominations than these. He brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men with their heads toward the temple of the Lord, so their backs towards the temple of the Lord, their faces toward the east, and they worship the sun toward the east. And he goes on and on. So basically what I'm saying is that the reason for God's judgment and this suffering is they had defiled his sanctuary. And it's detailed very clearly in 5 through 18. Detestable things, uh, images of foreign gods were put in the very temple of God. As a result of that, they had diminished the word of God. They had not valued God's word. As a result of diminishing the word of God, God said, he would diminish them. And our time has gone, <laughs> but uh, we'll take this up again next time. But we can see that God was very upset with Jerusalem and Judah because of their utter disregard of his statutes and of his sanctuary. And for us, we need to be very careful. I'll read just one scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And with that, we will close our message this morning. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. May God speak to us about the solemnity of these things. Amen.